بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد respected elders and brothers السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I just request all the brothers insha'Allah to come and sit as close as together as possible fill in the gaps insha'Allah there's still many gaps here on my right hand side and on my left hand side so I just request everyone come and sit closer insha'Allah we start by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send our salutations upon the best of mankind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Alhamdulillah it's the all mercy and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala father and grace that he has again gathered her, us together in his masjid in the house of Allah for the remembrance of Allah there is no other reason we are gathered here except to remember the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah says wala dhikrullahi akbar and the remembrance of Allah is the most is the greatest is the best thing you could do so we are here alhamdulillah to remember Allah this is why we are here this is a great gathering an auspicious gathering a gathering of angels a gatherings of mercy of Allah's barakat of Allah's blessings a gathering of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tranquility and his sakina this is a great gathering these are not my words these are the words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said majtama'a qawmun min baytin majtama'a qawmun fi baytin min buyutillah that no group of people gather together in one of the houses of allah and what are they doing yatluna kitab allah wa yatadarasuna baynahum they are reciting allah's book they are talking about allah's book they are teaching one another about allah's book illa nazalat alayhim as-sakina except sakina and tranquility and peace descends onto this gathering wa ghashiyatuhum ar-rahmah and the rahmah and allah's mercy comes onto this gathering wa haffathum al-malaika and even the malaika and the angels they attend this gathering and they encircle this gathering wa dhakarahum allah fi man 'inda and we mention allah in this gathering allah mentions us allah mentions us in a gathering which is better than this gathering subhanallah this is the the virtue the fadila the great advantage and benefit of being in such places in such gatherings so alhamdulillah for a number of years now on this night called new year's eve we have alhamdulillah held such events and programs for the brothers to cut to cover together and to come and to learn about the deen to remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we know on this night many of things take place people go out and they celebrate in celebration of the new year and people they go out and then unfortunately they go out with the wrong crowd they end up in the wrong places and they do the wrong things so we thought alhamdulillah what better way to start the new year and to end the current year than to be in the house of Allah talking about the greatness of Allah what better way is there than to be gathered in the house of Allah <coughs> also at, at the start of a new year people tend to make something called new year's resolutions they have objectives and aims and goals that, that they want to meet for the coming year so for example a student he or she may have the objective that this year i'm going to try my best in my studies i'm going to try to get the a's and the a stars i'm going to try to get into that college and that university i really want to go to and that might be their objective for the year or someone who's at work they might say to themselves that i've been in the same job for so many years i need to get another job i need to get a better job i need to get a promotion so that might be their objective for the year or many a time people have objectives and resolutions regarding fitness and health you know people say i want to get fit this year i want to lose this amount of weight i want to go to the gym and you know get some muscles etc so this is also a, re- a resolution people have another resolution we should also have is we should ask ourselves what is our connection with allah what is our connection with allah 
And how can we improve our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can we become more pious? How can we improve this? And this is another resolution we should have. We should strive to have. In fact, this is something we should be doing on a daily basis, not a yearly basis. One of the great companions, radiallahu anhu majma'een said, I think it was Umar radiallahu anhu, he said that account yourselves before you are counted for. This means that ask yourself, what are you doing? On a daily basis, what are your good deeds? What are your bad deeds? Account yourselves. Do hisab of yourselves. Do a calculation of yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take your account on the day of judgment. And by then it may be too late. So this is another reason why we are gathered here. So that we can make some resolutions regarding our deen as well, regarding our connection, our bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah now to commence this great gathering, what a better way to start than the recitation of the book of Allah. So for this reason, I would like to call upon our respected Imam Sab, Mulana Huzaifa Sab, to recite some verses from the Quran, inshaAllah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم <تصفيق> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال الذين كفروا لا تسمعوا لهذا القرآن والغو فيه لعلكم تغلبون فَلَنُذِيقَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَسْوَأَ الَّذِي كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ ذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ أَعْدَاءِ اللَّهِ النَّارُ لهم فيها دار الخلد جزاء بما كانوا بآياتنا يجحدون وقال الذين كفروا ربنا أرنا الذين أضلانا من الجن والإنس نجعلهما نجعلهما تحت أقدامنا ليكونا من الأسفلين إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ نُزُلًا مِّنْ غَفُورٍ رَّحِيمٍ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِّمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن 
فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم وإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نزغ فاستعذ بالله إنه هو السميع العليم صدق الله العظيم Sadaqallahul Azim, Jazakallah Khairan dear to Mulana Sal for the beautiful recitation from the Surah Hamim Sajda. And Mulana was reciting some verses. Inna الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ Indeed those people who say that our Lord is Allah, رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ But they don't just stop there, they don't, they don't just say our Lord is Allah, رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا They say our Lord is Allah and then they have istiqama. They are steadfast on this. So trials and tribulations will come to them. Tests will come to their iman. But they are steadfast. They have this, some, this thing called istiqama. This istiqama will hold them in good shape. And at the time of death, The angels will come to these people, to these people who had this istiqama and steadfastness. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا That do not worry, do not grieve, do not be anxious. وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ Listen to the glad tidings and the good news of Jannah and Paradise which you were promised. Subhanallah. So this is the great benefit of having this thing called istiqama. So how can we create this istiqama in our life? This is a question we need to ask ourselves. Moving on now, inshallah, and moving on to our first uh, speaker, we have Molana Zakaria Said, who is a chaplain and he works in prison. So he's working with people who are in prisons, locked up. He's giving them nasiha, he's giving them da'wah all the time, he's giving them advice. MashaAllah, he's doing great work in this field. And alhamdulillah, he's kindly prepared as well a PowerPoint presentation as well to go through. And it will be, inshallah, quite interactive as well. And the, the topic under discussion is the reality behind bars. So what is life like in prison? So I'm going to call upon Mulana Zakaria Saab now to deliver his talk, inshallah. الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين وقال الله تعالى في مقام آخر يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا صدق الله العظيم قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ألا وكلكم راع وكلكم مسؤول عن رعيته أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Respected brothers Elders and beloved young ones, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <coughs> I'm going to try to relay a little bit about what, how life is behind bars. I'm not a prisoner. Alhamdulillah, I've never been incarcerated. Allah protect me. Allah protect all of you. But I'm going to give you from what I've seen and from what prisoners have relayed to me. <coughs> before I do that, the hadith I just recited before you, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam tells us, "Allah wa kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an Every single one of you is a shepherd, 
and each and every one of you will be questioned, will be answerable about his or her flock. Should break it down? Each and every one of us is responsible in some shape or form. We have responsibilities and we will have to answer for those responsibilities whether we fulfill them to the best of our abilities uh, on the Day of Judgment. A father is responsible for his children, his wife, a mother for her children, her husband, for their parents. A child is responsible for his or her parents. A teacher is responsible for his or her classroom. Okay, An imam is re responsible for his uh, congregation. Hence, mashallah, you see imams going forward and they put, improvise and they put these kind of programs in place. They are only fulfilling their responsibility. <coughs> You can take a horse to the water, but you can't make it drink. So they will put in place whatever they can, but then after that, each and every one of us have a responsibility also to take from that. Okay, so whatever walk of life we're in, as an employee, we are responsible that we carry out our job properly. Not just when the boss is looking or not just when the manager is around, but we are honest and we are fearful of the fact that Allah is watching. And the day we have kiram and katibin. Okay, they write down every single thing that we do, we think, we say. And we are going to have to answer for these things on the Day of Judgment. So that's a very, very important kind of point to take home, to bear in mind in every given walk, every, every point uh, in our lives. Many a times when I'm walking around the prison, I get requests from prisoners. They want to sit down and talk. Hey, Imam Sab, please, can you give me five minutes? Give me ten minutes, I want to talk. Can you give me some time? Come, come, come and see me myself. So I try to make time for as many as I can, and I try to give them the time and listen to them. And many a times, certain things, sometimes there's a pattern, but certain things they say, certain things stick, stick and they hit home, and, and they resonate. And you ponder upon it. And then sometimes on the outside, Having listened to their stories on the inside, you see others on the outside involved in X, Y, and Z, and you think, you see the pattern. You understand? As a prison imam, I can see that, okay, this guy is heading full speed ahead towards prison. You understand? But sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes you're not heading that way, and you could still land into prison. A point to bear in mind that those that are in prison, they are also humans like us. They are also humans like us. Um, khair, so one, one, one incident that's really kind of uh, come to my mind today. I was working at Feltham, a young offenders institute. And uh, one guy, he came to me because he said, I want to sit down and I want to talk. Okay, no problem. So after a couple of days, I went, I sat down with him. What's up? And he said to me, I'm in prison because of my mum. So first thing I know, I assumed maybe he'd done something wrong and his mom called the police and hence he got in trouble and he ended up in prison for what he did wrong. You know, right now when we had the 2011 riots, um, after the shooting of, what's his name, Mark Duggan, lots of people were protesting, okay, because of Mark Duggan. But so many others were opportunists and they just went window shopping all night long because the police were involved in riots or involved in whatever they were involved in. They saw the opportunity and they went around shopping in curries and Comet and all these clothes shops all night long and taking things home. That they're not entitled to. Argos. Um, there were certain guys who took stuff home. You know, one guy came to me and he said to me, I, I, I stole 400 camcorders. Do you understand? But his mom hid 200 of them for him. Do you understand? And he got away with it. He only got caught with the 200. Do you understand? And then there's certain people whose parents said, no, you did wrong. And they called the cops from up front. Do you understand? So I thought maybe he did something wrong and his mother's called the police and that's why he's in prison. And he went on to tell me a long story. I'm going to make it as brief as possible. He talked about how when he was a child, and he says, I clearly remember, maybe I was three years old, maybe four. He says, we used to go to visit people's houses, uncles, aunties. <coughs> and the adults would be in the front room, in the sitting room, they'd be talking away, having tea, whatever else. Us lot would be playing around. And sometimes I like a toy, I'm playing with something, looks good, so you know, play with it for a little while, then put it in my pocket. 
I like it. I want it. I take it home. Next day, my mom sees me. She's doing the washing. She's cleaning, cooking, whatever. She sees me playing with that toy. And he says, I know that she's seen me playing with it. And I know that she knows she never bought it for me. And I also know that she saw me playing with this at Fulla's house yesterday. So he says, my mom never said anything to me. Right? And this is somebody who's got memory from three, four years old. And he says, that gave me the courage. So then I started looking forward to when does Eid come round, when do we go to sit somebody's house, when does somebody die, when we go to visit somebody's house. I, I just do shopping, whatever I like I take. And this kind of... I felt it, because many times you know, we have our parents, we get bored, okay, talking to the young ones, sometimes we don't like it when our parents lecture us. Same old story, they keep moaning and moaning and nagging at us, right? They're saying the same old things. But they've seen stuff that we don't understand yet. So when this guy is telling me this, I'm thinking that, you know, this makes sense why our parents and grandparents give us all these stories that there was a boy and he did this and he cried wolf and this happened. Or there was a boy and he stole and then they found him and they chopped his hand off. Or whatever, they give you all these scary stories. But the, the moral behind it is, you know, don't steal or don't swear or don't lie. Or, or these kind of lessons. Sometimes even us as adults, sometimes, you know, we, we give a sweet to a child and say, Shh, quietly eat it, not on nobody. What we're actually doing, in fact, is teaching that child how to hide from his parents or hide from others, how to keep secrets. At that age, you're too young for that. You're teaching them to lie. So this guy goes on and he says, you know, so it came to a stage where we're at the house, somebody's house one day, and they had a remote control car. And I liked it. I never had one. So he said, I decided I'm going to take this home. But it was too big to put in my pocket. So what do I do? He says, I know my mom's on my side. I do need to take this. He says, when it came time to go home, I put my coat on, my shoes on, I grabbed the car, and I'm walking out with it boldly. Okay, he says, as a child, he's thinking that, I wonder what's going to happen. Is this one going to work, or is this not going to work? Right? Normally, I hide it, walk out with it, you know, telling no one, sorry, I've got to the other side of home now. I put it in my pocket, Khalas, they're not here, it's done, they don't even know it's disappeared, whatever. Over here, I've got a big object to walk out with. So he says, I, try, I tried my luck. I woke out with it. And he says, I, while we're at the door, <coughs> my cousin, their son, their child, he's crying. He's cranking my car, my car. He says, his mum is telling him, don't worry, Bita, when Abba comes home, we'll get another one. Make dua, Allah Pak will give us another one. And his, she's giving comfort and solace to her child. But he says, my mum didn't have the decency to slap me when I said, oi, put that back. Which is what he said she should have done. That went on and he says, you know, I do okay, my mom doesn't mind, so I do, I do. And he says, at school, you know, I go to school with two pounds, I come back with 40 pounds. Everybody else is getting changed for PE and I'm doing shopping. And he said, I have so many wallets, I give this guy a wallet, I take the money out, you want a wallet, you don't want it, you want it? No, okay, just chuck it away. I've got so many wallets, I don't need it, I take the contents out. And he says, my mom never challenged me. And it went on and he goes, you know, you have in like Sainsbury's and Quicksafe and Tesco and all these places, you have the money for the blind, the box, the charity the box. He says, on the way to school, I used to uh, go, go into the store and see where the secu security guard is. I'd run in, grab one box and leg it. Every couple of weeks I'd go and break it open, get 30, 40 quid, 50 quid, 100 quid, whatever comes out of it. And I enjoyed it. Time went on, my, so my sister was old enough to also go to high school, so... My mom said, no, I need to take her with me. So I said, well, now how do I do this? So then he made a plan with her. Okay, you wait here at this point. I'm going to come running like a bullet. When you see me come running, you just carry on running. I'll catch you up. And afterwards, we'll 50-50 we'll wash in the box. And he said, that went on for a few years. He said, eventually, one day on a Saturday or something, on a weekend, he was, <coughs> his mom told him, let's go shopping. They went. He's there to help carry in the bags. And that security guard, off duty or whatever, he recognized. And he says, I was quite bold. I thought, I go in my school blazer, in my school uniform. Once I run and catch up the rest of the school kids, no one's going to recognize me. And he says, I don't think he'd ever recognize me in my casuals. So he says, that guy did. And he called the cops quietly. And the police came and then they took me and they took me to that store. <coughs> they took me to the back room, sit down. Okay, you've been doing this. He said, no, 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 Allah, I'm a Muslim. Muslims don't lie. Muslims don't steal. Allah, this and he gave everything. And they said, showed him CCTV. So he looks at it, and obviously he wasn't prepared. So he said, I know who that is. That's my cousin. He looks exactly like me. I know who that is. It's not me. So they give him a phone. No problem. Phone him. Call him here. He said, 
So he's looking back and he's crying and he's saying, if my parents had stopped me at an earlier age, it would have got to that stage. So the point I'm saying here is, as for us adults, again, there's a very powerful lesson in here. That from a young age, it's very, very important. It's extremely important that we make sure these kind of habits don't infest our children. Child comes home with a rubber or a pencil or a sharpener from school. You make sure that next day you go back with that child and make the child apologize to the teacher and give it back. Make a point. So what? It's a rubber. It's only five pence. School is loaded. It's from my tax money anyway. It, you understand? You can come up with a hundred excuses. Stealing is stealing. You understand? That develops and goes on and on and on and on. And I tell you, so many um, people who have been uh, found guilty of robbery, stealing, doing jewelry shops, bank jobs, right? Or you name it. Every single story I've come across and spoken to the guy face to face, when the guy pours his heart out and he tells me about his whole life story from the beginning, the picture is the same. Nobody told me in the beginning. You could argue and say, well, where was your brains? Right? But it's too late for that. Nobody told him. You said, mom was too busy. Mom had to go work. Dad had to go work. They just were worried about money, 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 paying the mortgage, doing this, doing that. And they never had time for the tarbiyah. No one sat this child down and spoken to him or her. Same thing for maktabs. Very important that you not just focus on praying, 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 praying. Tarbiyah is a very, very, very big aspect. How to live life. Okay? So that's one point. Um, many times when I do these kind of talks, okay, what I do is uh, I'm stuck for ideas sometimes. So what I do is I, I grab a prisoner and I say to him, I'm giving this talk. What shall I say? So they usually give me stuff from their life and give me a bit of background of whatever they want to say. So there's this one guy, he told me quite a bit. So I said to him, you know what, write it down and make it a page. Okay, because too much to remember. So he wrote it down for me. I'm just going to read it out to you. The point I want to say is not everybody who ends up in prison is born a criminal or has lived a criminal lifestyle. Right? And with, especially in the Asian community, I can't say for others, because I'm Asian, I can speak for ourselves. We're very good at hiding things. We're very good at, if there's a problem in our family, our son or daughter is involved, we'll be embarrassed to go and get the help and support we need. You see your child starting getting into drugs or hanging about with the uh, wrong company, <coughs> We will be too stubborn and too arrogant to actually get the help we'll need. We'll just brush it under the carpet. And what that does, it makes the problem bigger and bigger and bigger until it's uncontainable. He said, I had you know, one case, this guy, he ended up in, he was in prison for some uh, driving offense. He got 130 days, which equates to about four months and 10 days. I went to speak to him and he says to me, yeah, my extended family think I've gone Jamaat for four months. <laughs> you understand? So, what? That's a reason, Jamal, man. Right? But do you understand where I'm coming from? We're very good at hiding problems. And you know, from an early stage, when problems infest and start, when, and you see other, other outside influences having an influence on our kids, it's time to react and it's time to make a difference. And the difference isn't to go around picking other pe you know, children and telling their parents, your son is corrupting my child. You have to kind of give the tarbiyah to your own child to make sure that this problem doesn't kind of, there's no fuel added to the problem, right? So it's important that we get the help that we need. So anyway, I'm going to read this out quickly. It's quite a hard thing to put pen to paper and describe and explain how you end up in prison. Because you fail to heed the warnings of your parents, of your friends and of the general public, I have suffered immensely over the past four years and dredging up the past is a touchy subject and one that I am not proud of. But should, one, but should one person learn from my mistakes, then it will be all worth it. Born and bred in Upton Park, my family and I moved to Wanstead when I was 18. I was living the life of a king. I had just bought myself a dog, and after years of wanting one, but never allowed one in the house, so when we moved out of our, uh, into our new house, our new house had a side entrance. I managed to play the Hanafi Madhab card and say, Dad, dogs are not najis, it's only the, uh, the saliva is, it's okay to have a dog so long as it's not inside the house and it's only for protection, etc, etc. My dad soon relented and I bought a puppy Rottweiler, much to my mother's annoyance. I also bought an Audi A4 to drive about in, passed my motorbike test and my dad reluctantly bought me a 600cc superbike, which again was much to my parents' annoyance. 
How many other 18 year olds had the choice of three cars, a van and a motorbike to choose from when going out? Life was great, alhamdulillah. So two years later, and I'm soon to finish college and start university, although I didn't quite conform to being a good boy by way of not listening to my parents when they said don't ride bikes and don't get dogs, I was not by any stretch of the imagination a bad boy. I didn't break laws or didn't commit any crimes. I knew better than to do such a thing. I came from a respectable household. I smoked cigarettes, but nothing else. I grew up sheltered that at 20 years old, my mum would still call me if I was out after 9 o'clock to see when I would be coming home. I respected and feared disappointing my father, who is very traditional, conservative Pakistani, and I certainly wouldn't do anything to bring real shame on the family. I used to look at other Muslims who would get arrested for any other offences with disgust and with hatred. I thought I was much better than those petty criminals. Little did I know that what was, happen what was about to happen to me. Two months prior to starting university, I get home from college and then make my way to my friend Alex's house. Having arrived at Alex's house and having spent an hour in each other's company, I decided to go home. Mum was making pasta today and told me specif specifically not to eat out, so I thought I'd get home. Only Nikesh asked for a ride on my bike, as did Marcus, so I accepted and took Nikesh for a ride down Ilford Lade, Long Bridge Road, and back to Alex's. Then Marcus got on the bike and we went for an identical ride out. Remember when I said I didn't commit crime or break any laws? Well, you see, I sort of lied. There was one thing that I broke constantly, the speed limit. I always thought of it as a misdemeanor and not something more serious. What's the worst that could happen? Get a few points on my license if I'm caught. But hey, at least my friends will have something to remember as we sped down Long Bridge Road at triple the speed limit. That'll give me some, some bragging rights. Alas, this time everything suddenly changed. As we were coming up towards Barking Roundabout, a car pulls out suddenly and me, Marcus, collide directly with the car. I end up fighting for my life with multiple fractures, laceration to my neck and Marcus, well, Marcus was dead. In, in that one moment of madness, I had killed my friend. My parents always told me not to speed, but little heed did I take to the adverts that say speed kills. I didn't think I was breaking any laws or that it would ever lead me to come into prison. If someone told me I was going to prison in the future, I would have laughed my head off. Me? Prison? I'm not criminal. I'm good, well-behaved Muslim. It seemed like a million miles away, but breaking, by breaking the speed limit, I was no better than those who steal or deal drugs. I had caused death by dangerous driving, and now I'm languishing in prison for thinking I was above the law, for thinking my crime of speeding was no crime at all. Learn from me. Speed does kill, and speed can land you in prison. Although there was no intention to kill anyone, it was my action that caused Marcus's death and that is something that weighs very heavy on the conscious. So you see, I went from hero to zero with a split second. The moment that car pulled out, my life changed. Gone was my university plans, my cars, motorbikes. Came two years of pain, agony, prosecution, nine operations, one funeral, a five-year driving van, four years in prison and a lifetime of scars to remind me of my actions. I now have a permanent disability, poor health. Take care of your health while you still have it. Don't make the same mistake as me. Salam. Now this guy, I see, he's got, <clears throat> he's got scars all the way down his body. He showed me the arms, his legs, all the way down, both legs, both arms. Mad scars. Full laceration over here, this deltoid mashed up. He says they spent, the family had to spend £40,000 on trials and court cases for him. Right, so the whole life structure, just not him, but everyone's life has changed. Do you understand? And same thing with those who kind of get into drugs and this and that as well. It's not just you, the individual, that is going to suffer. The whole family has to suffer for it. Because so many times, you know, when these drug dealers, when they can't get to you for whatever reason, they will get to whatever they can get to you that's related to you or linked to you. Not very long ago, a few months ago, I had to go break news to a prisoner that his brother had been stabbed and killed right outside their door, about 10 feet away from their front door. What had happened was he was studying for his GCSEs. Um, he had an exam the next morning, so they were studying at a friend's house, a few of them. He's coming home, maybe 11, half 11 in the evening. He's about 10 feet away from his front door. And all of a sudden, a 4x4 four four pulls up, three guys jump out, beat the crap out of him, stab him up and leave him bleeding at the speed of. Before the ambulance got there, he died. He was pronounced dead. 
And as soon as I broke the news to this guy, he just started crying. And he said, Imam Allah, he goes, I know what this is about. I know who did it, I know why they did it. Just because I'm in prison now and they can't get to me now, they're going for him. He said, how many times have you read in the newspapers articles about somebody put a firework through somebody's door? Petrol bomb somebody's house? He said, the article says what it says, but there's more stories behind it. And I'm telling you, so many a times there are cases of because of drug dealing, because somebody owes somebody money or that kind of thing. You said, so these problems, they're not worth going down. They are totally not worth going down. Not one bit. I'm telling you. And every single guy that I've asked in prison, the one message they all give is, no, tell them don't come to prison. It's not worth it. Now, yes, the system is there and, you know, the prison service, they do, do whatever they can. They try, you know, to give everybody, whoever's inside, a, a decent life and a decent way of living and decent food and everything. But hey, it's still not going to be the same as what we would have at home, is it? Do you understand? Not long ago, there was one case, you know, I call the guy uncle because he's, he's in his 50s, right? Um, one uncle, uh, one he, a brother, he's in prison for some immigration or something like that. He's not a career criminal, if you like, okay? He's in prison and some young 21-year-old guy comes up to him and says, hey, what are you in for? So he looks at him. Uh, oh, this guy's 50 years old. Uh, so he says, mind your own business. You do your things, leave me alone. He said, so that 21-year-old, he doesn't like the answer. Why do you tell me? I asked you what you're in for, what crime did you do? Tell me what you did, you're not telling me. So he goes around spreading, spreading a room, like that guy's a pedophile. Right? Now, prisoners, you know, they don't like, they don't rape, uh, uh, abuse in women, child uh, abuse, that kind of stuff. They don't tolerate that as well. So then a few guys got together and then one in the morning, there, as soon as the doors were open, they went in the cell, beat him up broke his jaw, black eye, sent him to hospital. And the guy's crying and he goes, you know, I didn't even do anything. They said, so it's not a life that we'd choose and we'd want to go down. They said, um, I've brought for you guys a few kind of uh, weapons and stuff that prisoners have kind of made in prison and it's, it's, it's deadly. They said, this is I'm going to leave them here for you guys to see afterwards, inshallah. But, you know, they're in evidence to you. Don't take them out. Don't open them or anything, inshallah. Um, and don't take it. Um, this is from a tin opener. Uh, sorry, a baked bean can. Okay, they've kind of just sharpened the edges, made a knife out of it, put a bit of bed, bed sheet on it, and made a handle, and it's a stabbing implement. Over here, again, this is... You know you have a door kick. I'm not sure if you have them on your doors. You know, at the bottom of the door, you have a silver panel strip. So the door, the wear and tear and stuff, health and safety, right? So somebody's ripped something off that and they've cut it and they've made a knife out of it. And I tell you, the damage that done, right? You can see this. Hey, there's these things, this. It's quite gruesome. They said, and stuff like this happens, you know, they'll get batteries put in a sock or whack it on the head, a snooker ball, you know what I'm saying? And you could get attacked for all sorts of reasons, any reason at all whatsoever. Over here what they've got is, um, you know you have inside the fridge, you have a shelf. You know, the white, nowadays, you know, everyone's kind of a bit upmarket, so you have glass shelves and stuff, but if you remember them white shelves, you had the racking inside the fridge. So broken from that and from the inside of that, they've made again a stabbing implement. I don't need to explain what this is. Yes, where I'm coming from. So it's not a life that we we'd want to live. You understand? Out of a spoon, sharpened into a knife. A toothbrush. Okay. Um, got the blades of a razor blade and put put them onto a toothbrush. And again, they just come and slash you. You understand? So you know, Allah, Allah protect us from ever ending up in a situation In the hadith Rasulullah tells us Al-mar'u ala deeni khalil A person is on uh, the way of his friends right? The Quran verse I recited that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Fear Allah and have friends, truthful friends <coughs> It has a very big impact 
I remember one incident, there was, I was working at Belmarsh and uh, I was literally on the way home and the phone rings, my office phone rings. So I pick it up and it's a governor and he says, oh, can you come down? And we need translating, there's somebody here who doesn't speak English. So I went down and I see this elderly brother. Um, he didn't speak English. So I speak to him in Urdu. And uh, he said to me, you have a chabi here, have you got keys? I said, yeah, because can you let me out? So I said to my uncle, no, it doesn't work like that. The police will come, you know, now they'll take you to court and there'll be a case and there'll be a trial and they will decide whether you're guilty or not guilty. And so what he tells me, he says, you know what, I was just coming from the masjid. And you look at him like a Buddha, you know what I'm saying, like first of kind of guy, right? He goes, I'm coming home from the masjid, a car pulls up, a few youngsters, and he says, Chacha, you want to lift home and drop you off? So I sit inside and we drive a few yards and get pulled over and they search the car and they find some drugs. And he says, you know, nobody owns up to it, so I arrest everybody, everybody's behind bars. He says to me, I didn't do anything. So I said, no, no, that's not for me to decide, there's nothing I can do about that. This was like a Thursday evening. Saturday morning, I get a phone call from one of my colleague, uh, one of my fellow imams, and he says, uh, somebody's had a heart attack and he's ended up in hospital, so I, I'm going to go and see the person. So he goes, and then after about two, three hours, he phones me, he said, this is the name. And uh, straight away I knew who the guy was. I said, look, this is what happened that day. He must have been in a state of shock. And that night I asked him, does your family know you? No, no. I go, have you phoned them? I go, you know, you're entitled. They'll give you a five-minute phone call to phone anywhere you want to let them know where you are. He goes, no, no, no. They, they, what do you call it? They base the and the sh embarrassment and shame. No, no, no. I can't tell them. I said, do you want me to phone them and let them know? No, no, no. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. He said, and about two, three more hours later on that Saturday morning, my imam phoned me back again and he goes, he's passed away. You see? So it's not a, a life and a place that we, we'd want to be in or go. Okay, I'm going to kind of try to whiz through this. Okay, uh, we read the hadith, Allah wa kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulan ra'iyyati. Um, each and every one of us have a responsibility. So, you know, please, within your means, whatever we can do for yourselves, for our children, for the generation, for our society, to better the environment, to better society, we need to do it, right? Allah protect us and our society from ending up in a situation as such. I'm going to start off with a bit of the stats, okay? Total prison population at the moment is in the region of 85,886. Yes, this is from last year, but when I was checking this last week, it's only changed by about, uh, with about around about 100 or so. so. I didn't bother editing a lot of it. Can we see that? Breakdown by religion, okay, there's... It's too tidy here. Okay, Anglican is 19% free church. There's 1% Roman Catholic, 18%. Looking for Muslims, 15%. Okay, 15% of the prison population is Muslim. If we just look at the stats in, in London itself, okay, in Belmarsh, 241 prisoners are Muslim. So that's 27%. That's over a quarter of <coughs> Belmarsh Muslim offenders. So if we just break this room up, okay, that's like a quarter of this room in prison. That's quite a high number. Brixton, 33%, so even more, around about this much, okay, everybody in prison from this. It's a big number. Feltham, 35%, it's getting bigger. Coldingly, 19%. High down 14%. Harmonsworth, which is an immigration removal center, more than half of the prison. 35%, 32%. Thames side, a quarter of the prison again. Quarter of the prison again. And a third of the prison. Yes, sir. Nationally, there's 12,600 approximately Muslims in prison. And just in London, 24% of London jails are Muslim. Break down again by religion in numbers. I'm going to give you a few seconds to just look at it yourself. Sadly, yes, women also end up in prison. By age, again, you know, it's the whole age, it's not as if only 20 year olds or 15 year olds or certain age range end up in prison. I'm telling you, there's, there's, there's a pattern and there's a, the whole age range. 
it, it really starts from terbiya at a young age, from 12 years old, 13 years old, that's when it really starts. Sadly, what we end up doing many a times is, after somebody's been into prison, we're trying to work on making sure they don't go back to prison again. Okay, which yes, it's a need and there's a, a, a need for that. We also need to work on that. But sometimes I feel to myself like, what are we doing as a community to make sure they don't end up there in the first place? Insan, tarbiya wise, what are we doing? What mechanisms are we putting into place? You know, things like youth groups, community centers, okay, uh, going on trips, you know, through the masjid, these kind of things. I think they're very, very vital, they're very important to show our youth that, you know, Islam is not a rigid religion. You can have fun, you can go football, you can go paintballing, go karting, skydiving, you name it, do it. Just make sure you don't miss your salah in the process. Do you understand? And as a masjid, if we've got a, f- a function, if we've got a youth group running and you're doing trips and you're taking the youth to these places, between the ages of 12, 13 till 15, you've taken them lots of places and done lots of activities, they've all t- automatically protected from hanging about in those areas. You understand? Automatically protected. Another story is coming to my mind. One guy, he, was, you know, he wrote a letter to his parents from prison. And you know, his parents, you know, typical Asians, it's like, uh, you, know, you brought shame to the family, you brought shame to the family, you ended up in prison. Right? Is that, you know, Faluda Hogya, this, that, right? He wrote a letter and he says, Look, you guys are telling me that I brought shame to the family. You guys brought shame to the family. Because you guys never had time for me. When I used to come back from school, food's in the microwave, just warm me and eat it. Oh, I'm given five pounds, just go chicken and chip shop and buy something and eat it. I come home half past three, four o'clock, dad's at work, mom's at work, nobody's home. Until eight in the evening, you guys are never around. I sit at home, I get bored. I go out, find friends, hang out on the street corners. Hanging about, too much time on our hands. Right? Idle, an idle mind, what is it? Idle mind is devil's playground or something, right? Right? Devil's workshop. Um, free time, nothing to do, just hanging about, sitting on the street, talking, laughing, what should we do? And then, all, you know, Shaitan comes in and we do something, you see a car radio and you smash the window and take it, and one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. You understand? So he's saying, you guys, where were you? You guys were too busy. Only time you guys ever sat me down was when teachers phoned you saying, I'm not done homework or this problem or that problem. And then after that was sorted, then you were interested. Then you wanted to sit down with me again when social services got involved. And then, and then you weren't bothered again. Then when the police got involved, when, that's when you sat me down again and then you were... And now I end up in prison, now you're saying I bought shame. Where were you when I needed you? You understand? I had to find my own family on the street. Okay? So, you know, these kind of things, it's very, very important that we have some kind of structure in our community. We put something into place that we don't end up losing our generation. Right? One benefit I see of this maktab system where you go to, the child comes home from school and goes to madrasa 5 to 7, the child becomes busy. You understand? Come home from school, quickly get changed, get ready, do your madrasa sabak, finish homework, whatever, quickly go madrasa. Come back from madrasa, you eat, you finish your school homework, you're so tired, they knock out. You understand? Monday to Friday, every single day. Then the only Saturday, Sunday you go take into account. You guys still have maktab on Saturday mornings, is that? Yeah. So again, okay, Saturday till 12 o'clock, the child's busy. After that, you've only got to worry about the rest of Saturday and Sunday. You understand? It's a clever plan that's put into place. Right? But then in school, the holidays and that kind of stuff, two weeks, ten days, one week, whatever holidays we have, what do we put into place for the youth? You understand? Sadly, we kind of get lost and divided into little, little arguments about is this allowed in the masjid, can we do this, this, you know, or look at the kind of clothes the guy's wearing. No, we need to overlook these kind of things. You understand how Rasulullah saw something, we overlook things. There was a person urinating in the masjid and we saw some overlooked it. Explain to him afterwards nicely, politely. No, one guy, again, I remember in prison, he's getting released. So I give him one advice. You know, every day in the evening, make sure you have lunch, uh, dinner, sorry, in the evening with your family, with your parents. He was married at the time. I said, make sure you're with your parents, have dinner every day. When the evening, shaitan comes out. Understand? If you have time in the day between Asr and Maghrib, it's only one hour, one hour, 20 minutes, sit in the masjid and read some Quran. If you're at work, fine. If you're not at work, make sure you do that much. He goes, no problem. He started doing that. After about five, six months, he came back to prison. So I looked at him and said, what's happened? He said, I was sitting Imam Sahib in the masjid from Asar to Maghrib, like you said. And one guy from the masjid committee came to me and said, Astaghfirullah, you've got an earring on, what kind of Muslim are you? You understand? And then he started talking to him because you've got gold teeth. Astaghfirullah, haram, haram, how can you be in the masjid? Get out. And he took me out. He said, where shall I go then? They don't want me. So he goes, I went back to my friends. And then one thing after the other, and then uh, got, got, uh, police tried to pull us over and tried to drive off, and whatever happened, happened, and he back, ended up in prison again. 
He said, that hurt me so much that how can if somebody comes to the masjid, we need to be welcoming and sit the guy down and understand the guy where he's coming from and give the guy the support that he needs. Do you understand? Very, very important these things. At the end of the day, we're all going to go in the Akhirah, we're all going to have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understand? What did we do? And every single one of us play a part. It's not just the Imam's job, the Imam will deal with it. Understand? We're responsible. You sit down, talk to the guy, understand where he's coming from, and try to get the help that the person needs. Okay, in Nabi Sallallahu time, the masjid was the center for everything. Somebody's tired, they go to the masjid to relax. In the daytime, somebody's tired, they go in the masjid and just go to sleep for a little while. You understand? Somebody's hungry, they go to the masjid. You understand? So, you know, nowadays, you know, we, we really do need to open up uh, our way of thinking. Crimes, uh, reasons people end up in violence against people, sexual offenses, robbery, burglary, theft, handling stolen goods, right? Sometimes you might be in, I don't know, little car park or something, and somebody might come to you and say, do you want to buy this? No receipt, don't buy it. Because you might pay him for it, but tomorrow you get pulled over with it. If it was stolen, you still get in trouble for it. You understand I'm coming from? So, you know, fraud, sadly, you know, it's quite prevalent. Drug offenses is getting even worse. Motoring offenses, and you know, a lot of these things are kind of interlinked with, with, with each other. By ethnicity, again, you know, it's, uh, especially in the Asian community, I know, you know people have this kind of thing that, okay, uh, Asians don't end up in prison. It's, they just look at black people and say black, and automatically there's a stereotype there. You understand? Um, If you look at over here, the Asians are winning, 41%. Black community, 30%. I don't know where we get these stereotypes from. <coughs> I don't know why we think of these kind of things. But hey, wrong is wrong. It doesn't mean if this race does it, then it's not that wrong. And if that race does it, it's a bit more wrong. <coughs> crime is crime, wrong is wrong. And I think where we really fail is we fail to address the problem. We fail to acknowledge the problem. We don't want to know, we don't want to see that there is a problem. We just, we'd rather turn a blind eye and not talk about it. Just a couple of weeks ago, I gave a talk in my masjid about drugs. And believe it or not, the amount of feedback we got saying, Jazakallah, the, 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 the topic, you've, you've just opened a door. And so many parents wrote back saying, my child is involved, my child is involved, we need to help, my child is involved. But nobody talks about it, it's a taboo subject. Understand? Sexual relations between boys and girls, nobody wants to talk about it. If we don't talk to our children about it, then of course they're going to get it from X, Y, and Z. Films are full of it. The, the way they kind of glorify and kind of uh, gl glamorize the thug life, the gangster lifestyle, loads of money, rapping, understand? drug dealing, driving nice cars, wearing chains and bracelets. Understand? The way they glamorize all of these kind of things, Right? Um, it's sad. And if we don't talk about it, our kids will look at these things and they will learn from it, they will take it in consciously or subconsciously and they will react to it. Hence, it's very, very important that we uh, put some kind of plan into action. Like I said, most of these things are interlinked. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about prison now because obviously that's what we're here for. Um, to the young ones, okay. Now, many times again, I've come across prisoners, they say to me, I never thought it was going to be like this. Right? Many times those who come to prison, they already have a brother or an uncle or a dad or somebody they know who's gone into prison. And now, everything they've heard about prison is all good, it's all fun. I want to go there kind of thing. Right? And once they come out, the way they put it, it's like a badge of honor, respect that I've been there, done it kind of thing. Right? They only talk about the good things and the fun things they had fun in and they enjoyed. They never talk about the first night, the first day when you get there into reception. First thing they do will give you a strip search. Okay? They'll tell you to crouch down and they'll sit there with the torchlight and see. No one talks about that part. It's humiliating, it's embarrassing. Right? It takes away your privacy. First night you'll go into the induction wing, somebody will take you around, they'll tell you what's about prison and how to make applications and how to go for Juma Salah, Alhamdulillah, you know, they're allowed to go for Juma Salah, etc. They'll tell them about food, what time lunch is, what time dinner is, what not, and the other. And they'll be given 
the clothing for the first night. Can I walk with this? <coughs> I'm going to show you a little bit of the clothing, right? This will be, I'm going to call this, what is it called? Woman beater, wife beater, right? That's what it's called, right? Vest, right? They give you a clean one for the first day. But then after that, every time you go for a shower, again, these are the points they want to say. You go for a shower, you chuck them in a dirty clothes basket. And when you come out, you wear a washed one. You don't know who's worn it last, where it's come from, right? A pair of shoes. I'm going to leave all this here, inshallah, for you guys to see at the end of it, okay? But it'll be this kind of stuff. Cup, plate, bowl, okay? And this is what you're going to be eating out of for the rest of the time that you're going to be there. You understand? Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if I can walk with this or break it. Of course, pillow, right? Piece of sponge and the bedding. You understand? So they'll be giving you all that, and that's going to be the rest of it. It's not, you know, you're going to miss your pillow, your duvet at home, right? The smell of your bedroom, all that's out the window. <laughs> cell sharing, you don't know who you're going to be sharing, sharing a cell with. One incident, one guy, he got beaten up quite badly. I sat down with him, went to see him in the healthcare, what's happened is that. And the reason he says to me he got beaten up was, it was a two-man sharing cell. And he had to go to the toilet at night. So he went to the toilet. And he did a number two. And obviously it didn't smell very nice. So the other guy didn't like it. So he beat him up. He beat the crap out of him. Right? He ended up cuts, bruises, the works. And he said to me, it doesn't make sense. If I need to go to the toilet, I need to go to the toilet. What do I do? You know, I wanted to draw out a cell for you guys here, but we ran out of tape. Okay, but it's basically it's around about from here till about where the uncle is sitting there. Yeah, yeah, just behind that. And, and that's roughly the size of a cell. So you'll have a bed in there or a bunk bed in there, okay, if it's a two-man sharing. Uh, you'll have a toilet a few feet away from your head, from your bed. Um, you have a small <coughs> sink. And if you're lucky, maybe a table and a, a tiny chair, right, to sit on. And, and that's kind of your living quarters for the rest of your 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 25, 35, whatever years you've got. Allah protect us. It's not easy, trust me. You could be bunged up with anybody, it's, it's, it's difficult, okay? This is a typical wing, okay, as you can see, if you could look at the spaces between the doors, you can probably judge this, how the size of each cell over there. There's three layers, ground floor, first floor, and, and the third landing, and they're more or less the same. A few pictures of some cells here, if you can see. Uh, the one day in the middle, it's uh, a, a double sharing, so it's got a bunk bed. And trust me, the bunk beds are quite, it's quite low. You know, it's not that you've got loads of space under it. Okay, anybody you could be sharing cells with. Okay, prison clothing, I've kind of talked you through that. Food, okay, lunch, sometimes you get a hot meal. Uh, generally, you'd end up eating, you'd be locked behind your door, and you'd be sitting there eating on your own. Quite miserable, it's not really that exciting. Um, showers and stuff, okay, nowadays alhamdulillah they're building certain prisons with uh, in-cell shower and stuff, but generally it's not available everywhere. Uh, you, you'd have showers which are kind of communal, um, sometimes you'd have showers with uh, cubicles, but the door's obviously just just half, like from your knees till maybe around about your chest size, so obviously activity can be seen, um, uh, supervised. And many times in the showers, a lot of things go wrong. Right? People don't like you, they're going to come and get you there. You know on the outside, if you're scared of somebody, you can run. And you can change how move houses and you can go somewhere else. And you can make sure you only go out in the daytime, or you can make sure you lock your car doors. There's lots of precautions that you can take. You understand? But inside it's a little bit difficult. Because you're, you're on a wing with another 60 or another 128 or whatever prisoners. And after the doors are locked, the doors are locked. There's only so far you can go. And you know, sometimes you have to go for a shower. You need a shower, you need a shower. So if it's a time, you know, there'll be times for showers, they'll allow you like from 8, 10 till 8, 25 or something in the morning, you'll be allowed to go for a shower, that's whoever needs to go, you go then. So if there'll be somebody there who you don't like or he don't like you and they'll have words there and they'll make exchanges there and, and they'll do what they need to do there. You understand? There's, there's little that you can do. Allah protect us. Picture of the showers, 
Okay, um, that's a very brief attack. Uh, somebody that got attacked. It's a masjid, so I don't really want to display that. Um, people die in prisons. Okay, that also happens. Sometimes, you know, when we're involved in all the street life and enjoying the life that we do, earning a bit of haram money here and there, we fail to think through all this stuff. You know, people are bold about it. You know, you try to give them the siha, and sometimes they're quite bold, saying, yeah, well, I'll write prison, what? I'm not scared. But, you know, these things happen. You know, people die in prison. Sometimes naturally, sometimes get murdered. Okay? You miss out on some people die in our family outside. You might not get to go to the funeral. Understand? If it's a very close relative, your parents or your child or your brother or sister um, that passes away, then they try to make, they do risk assessments and try to make arrangements for you to attend the funeral. But again, when you go there, you will be handcuffed. So you'll be in the janazah salah praying your salah, and the officer will be next to you with the handcuffs. Understand? And if you're one of those guys who your family have told, okay, my son's gone four months jamaat, right? They're going to wonder, okay, why have you come back from jamaat with handcuffs? Understand? Escorted. Where is that coming from? People come out with crazy, wacky things that they tell the families. But then you have to take into account. Now, do we allow, uh, do the families have to make a decision? You're going to have to make a decision. Do you want to go to your father's funeral? Everybody in the community is going to be there. Everybody that's related to you from Leicester, Blackburn, Bolton, and beyond are going to come. Whole society is going to be there. Your mom's is going to be there. Right? Your neighbors are going to be there. Everybody's going to see you escorted with two officers in handcuffs, do you want that? Or then do you not go to your father's funeral? Do you not go to your wife's or your son's funeral? Then it's not coming from. It's a heavy choice you have to make. You miss out on family weddings. You're out of the picture. And you know, face it, it's like a parent has five children, six children, <coughs> and you're the unlucky one who decided to end up in prison. You were living that life that made you land there. Now, the parents have got a choice to make. Now, do they come to visit you every single week or they make sure they do the tarbiyah of the rest of them who don't get affected as well? You understand? So sometimes, you know, you feel neglected inside. You're just sidelined. You're, no one's got time for you. Sometimes, for whatever reason, you might be shipped off, you know, to Birmingham or to Wakefield or to another prison far beyond. So then it becomes a job in itself to come visit you. Even if it's in London, it's a job because you know you, you need so many hours to get there, and you have to be there in time with your clearance and security checks, and they let you in this, that, another, and eventually, you know. So if it's far away, then how how many visits will you get? You know, I've seen cases where persons in prison who's not a criminal as such, if you like, is one of them guys who was involved in a few little things here and there, messed up, and he's ended up in prison. Now. Other guys take advantage of this guy. They give him a choice. Now, okay, your mom's coming to visit you next week. Somebody will meet her and give her this parcel, certain drugs, phones, whatever it might be. Tell her to bring it in. If she doesn't bring it in, we're going to slash you up. We're going to cut you up. So he's got to make a choice. Either he gets her to bring it in, and he doesn't get cut up, but then 99% when she gets caught through the security checks when she's coming in, then they will, you're already in prison, so you can't even run. They'll just hold you until the police get there, the police will come, they'll arrest you, and she'll end up in prison as well. Or you don't risk your mom ending up in prison, because obviously you don't want your mom to end up in prison, and you don't tell her to bring it, then they're going to cut you up. You see, so you're in a predicament, and life becomes very difficult. And this is all I'm giving you stories from stuff prisoners have told me. Okay, I've told you about going to, uh, going to funerals, a few pictures of weapons, some of these and others. Okay, you can take a look at the kind of stuff top right over here. You can see the toothbrush. Next picture, it's a little bit... It's, it's not very... Uh, significant damage done to this person who got attacked. I'm going to put it up for three seconds. If you're squeamish or if you've got young children, you just cover the eyes for maybe three seconds. Right, so that kind of stuff happens. And it's, it's, it's difficult. It's, what do you do? <coughs> Quite a very short case study, okay? Crime doesn't pay.
let's say you steal an iPhone, okay, uh, go on iPhone 6, 7 now, isn't it? Or is it? Yeah. What's the latest iPhone? Okay, sorry, when I wrote this, it was iPhone 4 then. Okay, <coughs> you nick an iPhone 4 and you sell it for 200 pounds. Let's say you get caught for it and you get, you're given three years sentence to stay behind bars. If you divide that, okay, 200 pounds by 36 months, that's going to work out to five pound fifty-six. Okay, so you've basically just given up three years of your life to get paid five pound fifty-six a week, and that's assuming that they never took the phone off you, okay, or you've managed to uh, uh, use that two hundred pound up. If you haven't, and then <clears throat> they've taken the two hundred pound off you as well, then you've li literally kind of uh, just given three years up for nothing, okay. Per year, you've earned sixty-six pounds, okay, basically for that two hundred pound phone that you stole. If you had a job and you were getting paid twenty thousand pounds, you'd earn sixty qu uh, sixty grand by the end of three years. If you never had a job, even on job seekers, you would have got eight grand at the end of it. <clears throat> so the point I'm making here is, it's just simply not worth it. Many times we, you know, just maybe two or three months ago, I was speaking to a young kid in in, our, in my area, and he, he's asking me advice, and he said, "Look, you know, I can get one gram of weed." For ten pounds, I can make two joints out of it. I can sell them at ten pound each. I make twenty quid, hundred percent profit. I've already got a customer; she's willing to buy it off me. I know who's giving it to me. I go sell it to them. If I just do it, maybe ten, fifteen times, just make about a thousand to fifteen hundred pounds. After that, I won't do it anymore. You understand? And that temptation is there. You know, it's a little bit of quick money. I just, I just do it a few times. No one needs to know. Just take it from this guy, give it to that person, and I've got my money. Khalas, no one else needs to know. No one making a big deal of it. I'll do it on the way to Madrasa. I'll do it on the way back from school. What's the big deal? Do you understand? It's only a small packet. And that kind of, this greed kicks in. And that's how shaitan works. He makes you want a little bit more, 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 more. And then before you know it, it, it it's too late. You're too deep inside it. Sometimes young kids end up in it because some drug dealer or some gangster will grab them and say, okay, all you got to do is just make this drop off. Go drop this over there and I'll give you a hundred pound for it. And it's not a big deal. You know, it'll go by bus, it'll cost him a pound, two pounds to get there, drop it off, back in half an hour, 45 minutes, made a hundred pound. It's just a few letters, a few papers. And that's how it starts off with. And then he puts a few drugs in, a few this, a few that, a knife, a gun, and whatever. And before you know it, you're in so deep that you can't get out of it. Understand? So a word of advice to our young ones, you know, it looks like quick money, but trust me, easy come, easy go. Right? You know, prisoners say get rich or die trying. Right? This one sticks to me. Right? And that's what exactly it is. You try to get rich quickly or you waste your life. Another case study, selling drugs, let's say you made five five thousand pounds, average just out if you get five years for it, that's a thousand pounds per year that you've got eighty three pounds, okay, per month. If you had a job, you would have come out with 100 grand on 20k a year. And if you never had a job, then you would have got at least 13,000 pounds even on job seekers allowance. You said, if you ain't got a job, go for these grants, go for these job seekers, go sign on, right? But trust me, it is not worth, it is not worth anything to kind of go down uh, one of these kind of routes, right? Uh, drugs just totally stay away from it. Um, one of the prisoners I was talking to just last week, and you know, a few of the points he said to me, he goes to me, uh, how he started off, he goes, you know, he started off like this, just small deliveries, drop-offs here and there. Um, somebody wanted him to go up to Brighton, so he went and done it, he got a few hundred pounds out of it. And he said, I wanted to go to um, Holland, he goes. He says, I used to have arguments with my mum, because my mum kept hiding the passport, she wouldn't let me go. And you know, I told her, look, it's a school trip, a few friends are going, just going with friends, this and that. But really, he goes, it was about drugs, okay? Because she never let me go, so I didn't get to go. I never made a lot of money there, but hey, I still found other ways of doing stuff. And he goes, he went around, you know, he'd hang out in these flats and he'd sell and whatnot and the other. He goes, one day he got to a stage where certain guys were after us, after one of my friends, he says, and they found out where he lives and they went and knocked on the door. And he says, he was peeping through the, the what do you call it, the key, non keyhole, the eye hole, you know, you, you see who's, who's there. Dora. Dora. Dora, thank you, big word, I don't know it, right? Um, so he's looking through that, and that guy, he's got a gun on the other side, he shoots, bang, half his head's gone with a shotgun. 
And he said to me, you know, I went to the funeral and said, his mom was in tears. She had to bury his, her son with half a head. He said, and he said, Imam Sahib, because I still didn't take heed. So I used to listen to talks of so many shuyuk on YouTube, this, that, another. I used to go for Jummah every week. But there was something that kept pulling me and kept taking me in that direction. I said, I'd, I'd be Sufi, I'd be Naik, I'd do all the ibadat, I'd make sure I'd fast in Ramadan, I'd do all that. But still, on the side, I still did a little bit here and there. It was just hard to get away from it. Inside, and he goes, that just went on. And you know, sadly, he's inside now. And he says to me, if I had another chance, I, I would never do it. And you know, need, Allah, Allah tells us that you know, on the Day of Judgment, there will be people who will say, if I had another chance, Allah, get, let me go back to the dunya this time round. I won't do it. This time around, I'll be good. This time around, I'll, I'll live according to Islam. I'll li- live according to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sunnah. You understand? I'll live according to the Quran. Okay? The answer is that you fool. You've just come from there. You understand? You've, just, you've had so many years there. Now, and this is the same thing these guys are saying. That, you know, if I, had, if I could be out there, I wouldn't do it anymore. Right? The only difference here is, inshallah, when you do come out, you can change. There is means for you to change. Right? If you want to change. Allah protect us. Okay. A few things that I asked again, prisoners. That, you know, what can you say? So one guy says to me, "Every man is his mom's baby, right?" And this was coming from like a 45-year-old. He said, "No matter how old you are, you still miss your mom." And trust me, I'm sure you would. He says, another guy says to me, "I miss all the little things in life." So I ask him, "What do you mean by little things in life?" And the answer he gave me shocked me. He says, you know, little things, just like, just like going to the corner shop to buy milk. In my head, I thought, well, subhanAllah, so many times, you know, we go, we go home and the wife says, you know, you need to buy milk. And you're like, why didn't you phone me? Why didn't you tell me before? I could have brought you on the way back. Now I have to put my coat on and go back out again. Understand? And we find it irritating to go back and buy milk or eggs, bread, whatever. And he says, I miss that. I wish I could just go out and just buy milk and come back. Who, you know, who in the right mind are you looking forward to the end of the day so I can go to buy milk tonight? Understand? It's not something that you look forward to. But these guys saying, I miss these little, little things in life. But I feel like a burden on my family. Right? Rightly so. I spoke about, you know, they've got other children in the family. The parents have to make a decision that, you know, do we look after the tarbiya of who's at home? Or do we kind of give this guy attention and go to see him weekly basis, this and that? It's, it's difficult. Right? I lost all my dignity at the gate. Okay? When you get searched and stuff, you know, you don't have a choice. You got to go with it. Loss of family ties, relationships, no, no bond with my loved ones. You know, it happens so many times. You have a child, right? Sometimes people end up in prison while the wife is still pregnant. Or the child is two years, three years old. You understand? You get eight year sentence, 10 year sentence, 12, 15 year sentence. Child is growing up. It's difficult. It's difficult. Now, the mother has a very hard responsibility balancing, you know, she has to earn money and provide for the kids and the husband is in prison, it's hard. And the pattern I see is many times is these kids who end up in prison afterwards because the father figure is never there, no, nobody is there to give them that tarbiyah. You understand, the, the, the bond of the family, the structure, the mother and the father, they both have their own roles. And you know, you need both of them to bring up a child successfully. It's very difficult to do a single parent. I'm not saying you can't be done, but it's quite difficult. And many times I see a pattern where the father's in prison, the child grows up, nobody's there to give the child advice, right? Uh, the, child, the father sometimes writes letters and phones and tells the child stuff. Okay, look, your mom will say he's getting into this, he's doing this, he's selling drugs. And the father will tell the child off, and the child is going to turn around and say, oh, you've got no room to speak. You've got no room to speak. You tell, you're giving me advice from prison. You're in for drugs and you're telling me don't do drugs. Leave out. What do you do? He said, what do you do? You're locked up, there's nothing you can do. Hatred starts to fill in the child's heart. They start to hate the father. I don't like him, he's never there for me. He was never there for me. Who told him to do what he did? He said, and it becomes a difficult thing. You come out of prison and you, you know, your children are 15 years old, 16 years old. They don't want to know you. And this is, I'm just giving you real life facts, <coughs> real life examples of those that I've seen and you know, stories that these guys tell me. Allah protect us, each and every one of us. Your freedom of choice is in the prison's hands. Okay, they'll come open your door, open your flap, any point, any moment. You could be sitting on the toilet, you could be getting changed, whatever. Right? The freedom of choice is in the prison's hands. The, the prisoner will decide whether you can go to that funeral of your father or of your child. Your son. The prison will decide everything. The prison will decide whether which prison you go to. 
He said, yes, you can make a request and stuff, but at the end of the day, it's not your choice. The decision will be made for you and you will have to go where you're supposed to go. You understand? And so many times, you know, if somebody just starts to get a little bit comfortable in one prison, he tries, starts to make one or two friends, he gets to know the Imam a little bit, he somehow ends up with a decent cellmate, and you know, life is just about getting a little bit okay, and all of a sudden, one morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, the bang open your door, say, wait, 10 minutes, you're out, you're on the bus, you're going to Brixton, you're going to, I don't know, whatever. You understand? You don't have a choice. They'll move you when they want. <clears throat> you have no control about, about important decisions in your life. Okay, and so many things. Your own life, generally, whilst you're in there, right? They decide whether you're going to get your HDC, your tag, your release, early release, this, that, everything. Okay, even on the outside. Okay. Your rent's not being paid now, so your house might going to be possessed, or a mortgage not being paid, it's going to get repossessed. Right, so many different different things. Decisions about your children, school, what do you call it, parent evenings. You're just out of it. You're just out of the picture. You have no say whatsoever. And it's hard to imagine it, but if you're in that situation, it's like you got no hope left. Life becomes meaningless. Right, and hence so many times the people start they start self harming, cutting themselves, and trying to take their own life because you just can't see a way out. You know you're there for the next five years. You know you're there for the next eight years or whatever it might be. Even one year, it's a very difficult climb. Shame upon the family. Okay, I'm sure we can all understand that. Okay, hence we try to hide it, but it's not always uh, e easy to hide. People find out, right? One prison tells me you're constantly around drugs. Okay, other pr prisoners use it. This another. I mean, it's, life becomes difficult. You know, your cellmate might have drugs and they, they spin your cell, they search your cell and they find it. You both could get in trouble for it. You might be living a decent, a clean life. You might be making sure you're not involved in any wrongs whilst you're in prison. You're living to the regime, you're living according to the rules and regs. But somebody else has done something around you, that could maybe mean that you end up in the segregation unit. You might get added days, etc, etc. I can't help my family physically, emotionally or even financially. Right? I think that's quite explanatory itself. Financially, of course, you can't. Right? You're not bringing any money in. Emotionally, you can't be there. Physically, you can't be there. Right? For whatever it may be, your house is being repossessed and your family now has to move out and they go into social housing. There's no one there to help them actually move. They understand? Life is difficult. Bad people may take advantage of you. Okay, I think I've given you a couple of examples already. Right to marital desires expunged. Self-explanatory. Sleepless nights. Difficult. Sleepless nights. Over here at home right now, if you can't sleep at night, you know, you can get up, go downstairs, have some cereal, check your WhatsApp, right? I don't know, go for a walk, phone somebody, watch TV, read a book. So many things you could do. In there, you're in a small cell, 8 by 10 or whatever it is, and there's nothing you can do. There's nothing to see. There's no view out the window. It's just bars, right? There's, there's nothing you can really do. It's difficult. Feel lonely, very, very lonely. In, in about 2012, 31st December, um, fireworks night, quarter to 12 at night, everyone's sitting there watching the fireworks, okay, in prison as well, in their small TVs, they're sitting there watching the fireworks. Last 10 seconds, 10, 9, 8, 7, everyone's counting down, right? And uh, 12 o'clock, everyone's shouting, Happy New Year, banging the doors, kicking, yeah, Happy New Year, Happy New Year, everyone's shouting their heads off. 10 minutes later, silence, the whole wing, everything, the whole prison, everything is silence. And the prisoner is telling me, he goes, next morning at breakfast time, he goes, I spoke to a few guys. And he goes, it was exactly as I had thought. Every single guy was just sitting there behind his cell. Switch the TV off. And sitting there thinking, okay, 10 minutes of screaming, Happy New Year, welcome 2013. Now what? Still here. Still in the cell. Still in prison. How many more years am I going to do it? What was the point of banging and shouting, Happy New Year? I'm still here. Not going nowhere. How many more years am I going to carry this on for? Yes, son. Moment of self-reflection. Automatically, no one told him to do it. Everyone's thinking the same thing. Everyone's just going quiet, thinking, "What was the point of that?" You know what I'm saying. And same thing today. Okay, New Year's night. Okay, well then, tomorrow is another day. Okay. You know, if we're not making a change to our life, then you know, what difference does it make? Yeah, and I'm not kind of uh, commending uh, New Year's resolutions and stuff because we should be doing that every day. Umar tells us that we should be making muhasaba every night. You put your head on the pillow every night, think through your whole day. What did I do this morning? What did I do today? Who did I speak to? Who did I make smile? 
Who's, who was I rude to? Who do I need to go and get forgiveness from tomorrow? Have I done any riba? Let me go and make toba. Let me go and get forgiveness. We, need, we should be doing a self-account every single night anyway. You understand? So, you know, we, you will miss your mother. Okay, somebody else is telling me this. So many guys say that. You can't go to masjid, talks, programs, hajj, anyway. You're just out of it. He goes, I've missed all my family weddings. Right, I think he had four sisters, he was saying. He missed all four weddings. It's sad. You know, at wedding time is a time of happiness. The family gets together. You've got loads of friends, family. The whole week is kind of, you know, pomp and glory. Everyone's doing stuff. You're just out of it. It's miserable. You feel really lonely and sad. Always feel left out. Your future life is affected and or you always have that stigma attached. Again, that's a sad thing. Many times, you know, you go out there and somebody will look at your CV and say, nah, you've been to prison, I, I don't really want to give you the job. You understand? It's difficult, right? It's difficult. Even masjids wouldn't even take some time, you know, they say, no, no, the guy's been in prison. I, I just want to do feasibility of work. I just want to clean the masjid. No, no, it's okay, thank you. It's okay, it's okay, you're in prison. <laughs> it's okay. And they, yes, I lied. And it's hard, it's difficult. Right? You always have that stigma attached. Good relations you may build may be broken by sudden moves. I said that to you already. External family and others in the community may get a kick out of it. And again, this is a story that I've heard so many times. Okay, man's end up in prison. The family hasn't told anybody that he's in prison. Uncles, aunties, nobody knows. They all think he's going to Dubai for. Uh, he's got a job in Dubai, so he's gone there for three years or whatever. That's what they've told them. But you know, walls have ears. People talk. People have found out through other means. So. I don't know if it's an insani thing, but they'll come round to your house and they'll sit down and they'll have a cup of tea and they'll talk and then they'll ask, oh, how is your son? Oh, yeah, he's in Dubai, he's, uh, he's just got a new job, mashallah, he's doing well, this and that. Oh, okay, give him a salam, I haven't seen him for a long time. <coughs> yes, son. Another time they'll come again, they'll come again and they'll keep digging it, digging it, digging it until you tell them, you know what, really, this is what happened, he's involved in drugs and this is what happened, they end up in prison. They'll just keep digging it, yes, son, and turning it. And they'll make you feel worse and worse and worse. And I think that's a really difficult one to live with. You start to hate everybody in society after that. Life totally becomes meaningless. It's already meaningless whilst you're in there. It feels meaningless whilst you're in there. And you come out and it's, it's, it's not going to get any better. Okay, I want to give you a few minutes while uh, they set up, inshallah, for the next speaker. Uh, if you've got any questions. Okay, um, I've got a little treat for you. A little surprise. I've got somebody here who is an ex-prisoner himself. He was in prison. Uh, he did whatever he did. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave him the opportunity to t t turn his life around. Um, and mashallah, now he's doing well for himself. He's married. He's got a kid. Allah make his child healthy and pious. And... Uh, Mashallah, he's got a job. So he's working hard, right? I think he learned life the hard way, but Alhamdulillah, he's turned around. Okay, so of course there is hope. There is light at the end of the tunnel for those who want to change. As long as you want to change, Allah will help you to change. So I'm going to open it up for yourselves first. If you've got any questions for myself, I'm going to answer it. And if you want to ask him any questions, then inshallah, I'll call him up. If no one's got any questions, then I'm not going to bring him up for no reason. Like I said, you know, those who end up in prison, they're just people like us. Yes, and it's just people like us. They just slipped up somewhere. Maybe nobody was there to give them the right advice when they needed it, or whatever it may be. Any questions? Do you work around in London? Uh, no, I now only work in one prison. Right. Uh, yeah. So, is there, in your area, or you visited many mosques around? <laughs> I don't know how many. Is there any um, rehabilitation plan in mosques? There's lots of plans for rehab. Okay, there's lots of plans to uh, kind of reintegrate them back into society and stuff. Sadly, not enough masjids have taken it up. Masjids become very reluctant. I've been around to f f a fair few masjids around and spoken to them. <clears throat> the picture I get many times is, why should we? He ended up in prison. He did what he did. That's his problem. We should rot there. We should lock him up and throw the key away. You understand? 
and I'm appealing they can listen, mashallah, you guys have got a job, you got a warehouse, you got a factory, you got a shop, maybe you could do the cleaner, maybe you could do somebody stacking your shelves. Why don't you give this guy a job on minimum wage, you know, it, 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 and you'll be also benefiting. Do you understand? The people are like, no, 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 why should I, why should I? So then sometimes I turn the table around, okay, you don't give this guy a job. He's got a habit of drugs, he needs money. Okay, no one's helping him, he's gonna go back to his old friends. Then he's gonna start selling. He might sell to your children. Right? Your children might become involved. Or he might need money. While you're at work, he might come and rob your house. Right? Or your child might go and rob somebody's house and your child ends up in, in prison. And 10 years later, I'm going to be coming here and talking to you again. If somebody's coming out. Please, is there anybody out here to help this guy? Are you going to tell me the same story? Are you still going to say, lock, it, lock, the, lock, lock him up and throw the key away? You understand? And then you say, no, 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 then it's different. Why is it different? You understand? So, I think masjids could do a lot more than what we do. We have these programs, mentoring programs. Where you know we invite you if anybody wants to, I can put, open it out. Mashallah, good question. I can open it out to you guys. If anybody is interested, then uh, I'm sure you can contact myself through Mala Huzefa. Um, we can maybe make a day for you to come to the prison, see what the prison is like, take you around the prison, and if it's something that you could do and volunteer, maybe one day a month, two days a month, one day, uh, you know, every two months, and. Either come to prison and talk to guys, or when they release, we we'll match him up with you. And when he comes to your society, you be there as an assistant. Mashallah, Tablighi Jama'a, Lord, they do quite a bit, right? They kind of sometimes go and see these guys and stuff. Where the problem happens is, I have this guy in prison for two years, three years, four years. I've helped him to change his character, have a different outlook on life. I've helped him to start reading Salah. I've taught him the, you know, uh, what you call it, uh, Safai, Paki, Paki, and all these kind of things. And Alhamdulillah, he started to be a good Muslim. But what happens when he comes out? There's nobody there to hold his hand. I can't be there. I've got another 200 guys to look after. Do you understand? And that's the case in every prison. So somebody in the community needs to take ownership. And the guy's going to feel reluctant to come to the masjid because he's going to feel everybody's looking at me. You understand? He's going to be challenged by a certain person in the masjid talking to him in an arrogant way and he's going to decide, forget it, this is not the place for me. You understand? So we need somebody there that, you know, maybe we could phone and say, listen, you've got somebody coming up, he lives on Mansfield Road, he, and you know, you should see the guy. And when he comes out, maybe I can come as well, maybe <coughs> pair you up together, or you come to the prison and pick him up on the first day when he's released, have a chat with the guy, just get to know the guy. Allah, that's all. And then, you know, you don't see him in Juma one day, phone him. Where were you in Juma today? I didn't see you. Oh, I've got a new job, I'm actually working in Houston and I pray Juma day. Okay, mashallah, very good. What do you do? Okay, it's good. Listen, so they just need somebody to sign posts and help them kind of go through life. Because sometimes, you know, they've been away for so long, they don't even know how to use an Oyster card. Right? They don't know how to use the underground. They don't understand all this color coordination. So, you know, just to go to an interview or something, this is where mentoring comes in. And yes, you can help. But I think communities, masjids, they can do a lot more. But sadly, somehow, most masjids kind of just take a back step and think, we've got five times Salah going on, Imam Sab comes 20 minutes, there's a Jummah, Bayan every week. It's kind of enough, we're doing our bit. But I don't think that's our bit. There's a lot more we could do, probably. Anything else? What are the um, equivalents of churches doing in prisons? I mean, as a kind of, do they are there do some things that maybe masjids can see as actually? Churches do a lot. They actually have a prison outreach network, which is a national thing, and uh, it's a lot. Mashallah, they they have so much funding coming in from various. And that's something as well. You could draw funding for these kind of programs to put into place. They do a lot. They're well ahead in the game. They have mentors. They have, they have a lot of system. They have even every Sunday, you know, they have about 10, 12, 15 volunteers coming in, right? You know, uh, we've tried to get volunteers to come in for Jumu'ah, and people will come once just to see prison as if it's some kind of zoo, right? They'll come, they see the place, and I, I've, I've seen it now. I don't want to go there again. Yeah, we want you to come there so you can spend time with the guy. I'm one imam. We're two imams. There's 200 prisoners. I can't talk to every single guy. If there's five of you guys here, you can just go around and you talk to two, three guys, two, three guys, two, three guys. These guys, they feel empowered and they feel happy. Yeah, somebody's taken their time out from the community, free of charge. He's taken time out of his day and he's come to see me and talk to me. Understand? And wallah, if they, if a few words of advice you give and they act upon it, that's sadqa jariya for you. Understand? All the way. Every time that person does a good action, you will be getting rewarded for it. After we go in our graves, that reward is carrying on. So yes, um, they are well ahead in the game, and I think we should maybe learn a thing or two. Um, and you know, we believe in sadaqah jariya. We believe in helping each other. Then, Rasulullah has told us so many things about helping others. Then, so we should be 
doing a lot more than sadly what we are doing. <coughs> Sorry. What is your job? What is it that you do? What is my job? I'm an imam in the prison. Okay. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I lead salah. Okay, Juma salah or any other salah that kind of falls in between 9 to 4, um, if it's practical, uh, depending on the regime and stuff. Uh, other than that, I kind of help them with bereavements. So if somebody in the family passes away or stuff, then I will try to help them to go to the funeral. I will put the, speak to security, speak to the coroner, the hospital, whatever else is involved, and do risk assessments and try to get the guy to go. Okay, but then obviously you come up with certain obstacles that we spoke about already. Uh, other than that, um, nasiha, advice, one-to-one -one advice. Many times they want to sit down and talk, and nobody's given them that time to talk. So I just talk to them and give them the advice that they need. I teach classes. What has led you to? What has led it to me? You want an honest answer? Yeah. I was doing a PGCE and uh, I was doing a placement in a certain local school. And uh, at the time, somebody, uh, a colleague of mine, he asked me to come to Belmarsh to lead the Jummah Salah. He said to me, uh, what do you call it? You're, you're only doing placement uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday anyway. You're free. You need to lead Jummah anyway. We need a spare imam because our imam is going on Umrah or something. So I said, okay, you know what? I thought it's like a zoo. Let me go see it. So I went to prison and I did Jummah for two weeks. Uh, I did it from, I think, uh, 11 o'clock. I got there, we had lunch, did Jummah, went home. Did that for two weeks. Then he said, can you come for a few more weeks? And I was like, yeah, Allah, this is for free. I'm not doing this so much for free. But I did it a few times. And eventually, it led me to feel prisoners were a bit easier to deal with than school kids. So I thought, this is for me, and I just kind of got into it. I don't think the government kind of look at it this way that, okay, there's too many Muslims, so let's sort them out, kind of thing. It's just they want to reduce the rate of offending. Yes, and they just want to reduce the rate of re offending. Yes, and sadly, at the moment, uh, it's something like 70% or so come back to prison within the first two years after release. Yes, and which is a very high number. You know, if me and you had a company and we were manufacturing something and 70% of the goods are coming back saying it's faulty, you're going to go bankrupt. Yes, so I think they're working on plans to, and, and, and they, uh, they give grants out, as I said earlier, and, and they support any programs that communities put into place to reduce the reoffending rate. So it's up to communities. So it's not as if the government's going to pick on a particular religion and say, okay, let's try to help them a lot. So yeah, it, it's, it's up to the community what you put in and uh, work towards each other. So, so should be morally or physically, how dangerous it is to get involved? Outside, you can avoid it to a very large extent, I think. Outside is quite easy to avoid. So when they are released from the prison. Okay. So you, okay. I think it's easy. <clears throat> Unless you're involved in that kind of lifestyle, it's, it's quite easy. You, understand? Uh, you wouldn't know how many ex-prisoners are sitting within this gathering right now yourself. You understand? So it, it's... it's uh, if you are hanging about in the wrong place at the wrong time, then yes, maybe. Um, but then again, <clears throat> if you're going to get, let's say, mugged or robbed, it doesn't mean it's only going to happen at a particular time. It could happen any time, really. I think the, the more appropriate answer, I think it should be, we need to do something as a community to help these guys, because it's help that they need. <clears throat> it's not that a way of, it's not something that they enjoy. And, and believe you me, I, so many times I sit down with these guys, and they're telling me, I don't like this lifestyle. People are scared of me. I look at them when they run. I don't like it. I just want to have a normal life. I want to get married, I want to have kids, I want to have a job. I just want to live a normal life like everybody else. But for whatever reason, they've ended up where they have, and it's hard to get out of it. You understand? So I think as a community, the responsibility is on us. Rather than avoiding them, okay, socially or any other way, rather than avoiding them, I think we need to be at the forefront and say, okay, let's take this, let's tackle this open arms, and let's help them. As I said earlier, we're very good at brushing stuff away and not and avoiding it. We turn a blind eye and we choose to leave it because that's easier to do. You understand? But the thing is, we, we need to kind of go in full head on and try to uh, tackle it and, and solve the problem that way. Is that all, inshallah? Can I hand over?
Jazakallah khair to Mawlana Zakaria there for that very insightful presentation on life in prisons. And the purpose of this was to, of course, deter all of us from this sort of lifestyle and, and to get into crimes, petty crimes. So inshallah, that was very insightful. A lot of information has sort of taken. We thank Mawlana for accepting our invitation and coming in today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of his efforts. Ameen. I'm just going to give everyone about 20 seconds. We've been sitting for about over one and a half hours, so 20 seconds just to refresh yourselves. If you want to stretch your legs, if you want to stand up, stretch your arms, you've got 20 seconds. <laughs> Okay, inshallah, we're ready to go again. That, that wasn't a cue for people to start leaving. Okay, three, two, one, inshallah. Can everybody now settle down? Sit down, please. Sounds like I'm coming to school again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to take this opportunity now uh, to call upon one of the members of the management here at the masjid, Brother Abdul Rahman, and he's going to explain to us some of the the future plans of the masjid and he's going to try to sell you some calendars. <laughs> Abdul Rahman. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm going to try to sell you calendars. Right? Um, Thank for coming first of all on behalf of the management. Um, for us it's quite important that people attend these programs and they reach the communities. Um, so they're very grateful that these have come. Um, Ramda, this is our second year launching the yearly calendar. So I'd let some of you know what we've got. We started the yearly calendar um, brochure, as they call it. Um, so this is the second year. Um, our aim is to give you the right permission for Salah times as well, but also to change uh, culture and mentality that um, when you're given something, it's given for free. So I know a lot of people, if we give calendars for free, people take it. So that's normal, right? So what we're trying to encourage is that people could take a calendar, but in return, as a thank you, for, thank you is donate a minimum of two pounds. And what is two pounds will do or more, it will go towards a future building project, inshallah. So as um, a lot of people are talking about past few years that they want some building plans and projects, etc. So as a proactive approach, what we try to do is start this new the early kind of program. And what this does, it allows us to set some funds from the sending of uh, the early calendars and put it to one side. So the opportunity did come where we could do some sort of project or expansion or development of something that's needed for the masjid and that way we've got a fund on the side that we can use straight away without any delay. Um, just to add to that, um, also we do um, standing order forms. So once we spend a lot of the masjid and for the, for the community, um, we try to keep much open seven days a week and four days a day, um, provide services, um, but also to do these things, the masjid needs to be open, Electricity and stuff comes up and builds as the resides will know. Um, so obviously if we can take um, a standing water form outside and try to fill one in, that would be really good inshallah. Um, just to add, I uh, wasn't trying, but since tomorrow speaking about prison and services, I think um, it's important to understand when you donate, um, you're donating for, and your donation allows the masjid to provide a service. Um, with these things, they cost money, they're not free, and obviously the person who's coming, you want someone who's qualified or so much so time, these things add up and the cost adds up. And I think by donating and using a standing order form constantly, and more and more people do it, it will allow us and any other masjid to provide these services. So I do hope people can take standing order forms and the early calendars and encourage others to do so as well, inshallah. So I'll be exactly what I can. Okay, without further delay, uh, let's move on to our next speaker. 
and I'm not going to waste any time in introducing him. Last time I tried, he stopped me. So, Mufti Abdul Rahman, sir, if you'd like to come forward, please, inshallah.